We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his clergyman colleagues in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had concluded that the pace of racial desegregation quote, with all deliberate speed, was too slow. They concluded that our country needed to understand that the social revolution taking place could be summarized in three little words. Those words were all, here, and now. So they said to the country, we want all of our rights. We want them here, and we want them now. Dr. King had great expectations when President Kennedy was elected in 1960. These expectations, however, were quickly diminished when at the very moment the Kennedy administration tried to persuade young civil rights activists that they could use existing federal laws to engineer major racial change, it promoted a slew of die-hard segregations to the federal bench in the South who placed additional legal obstacles in their path. As judicial vacancies had arisen throughout the 1950s, President Eisenhower, for example, had selected unusually enlightened Southern candidates, including Frank M. Johnson and Albert Tuttle, all Republicans who went on to author a series of pro-civil rights rulings in Montgomery and in New Orleans. On May 19, 1961, President Kennedy signed a new omnibus judgeship bill, creating 130 judicial vacancies. Many of these were filled with friends and associates of leading segregationists, men such as William Harold Cox, sponsored and supported by Senator James Eastland of Mississippi to the Federal District Court in Jackson, Mississippi. Another being J. Robert Elliott from Georgia. Elliott had been the leader behind the 1948 Dixie revolt from the Democratic Party in 1948. He was a well-known white supremacist. Later in 1962, on July 23rd, he would issue an injunction against the Albany movement. By the way, the appellate court of Fifth Circuit overturned 90% of Judge Elliott's civil rights rulings. The injunction by Judge Elliott against Dr. King Ralph Abernathy and Dr. William G. Anderson and others in the movement, the Albany movement, to end racial segregation in Albany, Georgia, was received with anger and disappointment, especially so because he was a Kennedy appointee to the Federal District Court and the Judicial Circuit, covering Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and other southern states. Initially, Dr. King refused to obey Judge Elliott's injunction, even though I implored him to do so along with Burke Marshall, Deputy Attorney General for the Civil Rights under Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Dr. King's response to me when I was trying to plead with him that he had to obey the injunction was that the injunction was, quote, an unjust law, a code that the majority inflicts on the, on the minority that is not binding on itself so that this becomes difference made legal. He then on and went on, that on, he went on to further say, quote, a just law is a law that squares with the moral law. It is a law that squares with that which is right, so that any law which uplifts human personality is a just law. Whereas a law which is out of harmony with the moral is a law with, with, with morality. It is a law which does not square with the moral law of the universe. Another thing that he would say is that an unjust law is a code which the majority, which the majority inflicts upon the minority which that minority had no part in enacting or creating, because that minority had no right to vote in many instances, so that the legislative bodies that made these laws 
were not democratically elected. He asked rhetorically, who could ever say that the legislative bodies of Mississippi, Alabama, or Georgia were democratically elected when there are people of color who, because of the color of the skin, cannot vote? A just law becomes sameness made legal. It is a code that the majority who happen to believe in that law compel the minority who don't believe it to follow because they are willing to follow it themselves so it's sameness made legal. I submit that the individual who disobeys, who disobeys the law, whose conscience tells him it is unjust, and who is unwilling to accept the penalty, and who is willing, excuse me, to accept the penalty by staying in jail until the law is altered, is expressing at the very moment the highest respect for law. Now the movement in Normandy, Georgia in 1961, in 1962, like efforts in the spring of 1963 to end racial segregation in downtown department stores and public accommodations in Birmingham, reflected a new militancy on the part of the substantial segments of the African American community nationwide. Nick Bryan, in his book Bystander, John F. Kennedy and the Struggle for Black Equality, wrote, quote, many direct action campaigns then involved civil disobedience, protesters forced themselves under the wheels of police cars, chained themselves to buildings, and resisted arrest by falling to the floor rather than willingly being taken into custody. Protests were getting bigger and activist demands were growing broader by the day. So there was always that constructive and loving tension and difference between Dr. King and his lawyers. In connection with my own efforts to get him to obey Judge Elliott's July 1962 injunction, the first thing I did was to remind him of the separation of church and state. As his lawyer, I said to him, I don't tell him what to say or do in connection with his religious or philosophical beliefs. Accordingly, I don't expect him to tell me what I should advise him to do or say on matters which are clearly and exclusively matters of law and court procedure. Moreover, I reminded him that the injunction which he was prepared to disobey and ignore was not a law or legislative enactment. It was an order, a procedural order from a federal court, and that as a general rule, the federal courts had been favorable and more willing to uphold the constitutional rights of the civil rights of the civil rights movement. The injunction could be overturned and appealed by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal, I told him. Moreover, I again implored him, if he disobeyed Judge Elliott's federal court order, he would lose his moral standing and credentials to complain about state governors or various officials throughout the South who had or had announced their intention to disobey instances of federal court ordered injunction under the Brown decision. Eventually, after a heated discussion with me and a continued heated discussion with Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who made the same point I had made about his undermining and forfeiting his moral credibility by disobeying Judge Elliott's injunction, he agreed to abide by the injunction. We, of course, as lawyers, uh, I working with Orzel Billingsley and then Constance Baker Motley from the NAACP Legal and Education Fund, we appealed the injunction on the clear grounds of violation of the First Amendment rights of peaceful assembly and association of free speech. On the appeal, the injunction was overturned as anticipated. I first met Dr. King in the 1960s, when I was 29 years old, not a recent graduate from Boston University Law School, following military service in the United States Army during the Korean War. He had been indicted for perjury on his income, state income tax return. He had four able defense lawyers headed by Judge Hubert Delaney, an African-American lawyer from New York, and three other African-American lawyers, two of them who were tax attorneys, from Chicago and a local Montgomery lawyer by the name of Fred Gray. One Thursday evening in February, Judge Delaney called me and asked whether or not I would be willing to be his law clerk and assist his defense team in the preparation of the defense of the criminal case against Dr. King. However, this would require my going to Berkeley, Montgomery, Alabama for about six weeks. Now, I had, just, I had just recently moved to Southern California. I'd only been in California like six or seven months. And so I listened to Judge Delaney, and I said, with all due respect, Judge, 
I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I can't, uh, I can't help you. That was on the third season. Friday morning, early Friday morning, I got another call from Judge Delaney on it. This time he calls me, he says, Class, I didn't know what the conversation we had last night. But Dr. King is going to be in California. In fact, he's on his, he's in the air now. He's on his way to Los Angeles because he has a speaking engagement at the World Affairs Council, Quaker group, and then he's a resident. He's the uh, guest preacher at a church in, uh, in California. And uh, Baldwin Hills, California. And I listened. And he said, and I told him that the very first thing he should do when he landed was come and visit you. And I thought to myself, well, what is the judge thinking about? <laughs> anyway, fast forward. Well, first of all, let me just say parenthetically. In 1960, February 1960, by any stretch of imagination, Dr. King was a celebrity. Been successful in Montgomery Bus before he kind of been on the cover of Time magazine, Look magazine, Light magazine. And uh, when, I, when, I, when I told my wife, God rest her soul, deceased, that Dr. King was coming to our home, you would have thought, to put it in current contemporary terms, that an amalgamation of George Clooney, Michael Jackson, and so much, <laughs> the greatest superstar of all walking to my house. So Dr. King comes into this, my house. I mean, he brings it, he comes, he visits me. Um, he sits down. After, uh, introducing ourselves, I said, yes, we've been expecting you guys Delaney. And he gets right to the point. He says, you know, Mr. Jones, as Judge Delaney may or may not have told you, we have not, we have lots of white lawyers to help us. But what we need are young Negro lawyers. Negro lawyers like you. And I said, well, uh, Dr. King, I, I, I'm more than willing to be able to help you. But as I said to Judge Delaney, I just can't possibly go. And he went on to tell me, to describe in some detail about what he was doing. And he asked me some questions about myself. And I told him I was an only child, my parents were domestic servants, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, any leaves. I'm giving you the short version, the longer version you can see in the first chapter of one of my books. <laughs> and uh, when he leaves, my wife turns to me and she says, what do you think you are doing? <laughs> That's so important that you can't help this man that came all this distance to see you. And I said, excuse me, and that's not quite fair or accurate. He did not come this distance to see me. He had a speaking engagement in Los Angeles. And Judge Delaney thought it would be useful for him to stop by and see me. And, and besides, just because some Negro preacher got his hand caught in a cookie jar of stealing, that's not my problem. <laughs> She said, I don't believe you. I said, well, that's the way I feel. Well, as I say in my book, that was a cold night in Jones House. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Saturday morning, I got another call this time. The call is typically with sacrament service. Sweet Mr. Jones? Yes. My name is Dora McDonald. Yes. Mr. Jones, you know, I I'm Dr. King's personal secretary. But you know, he enjoyed his visit so much with you and Mrs. Jones, but he forgot to invite you to be his guest. He's going to be a guest preacher tomorrow in Los Angeles, and he wants you to come there. And I listened, and I took the information down. I got off the phone, and I immediately told my wife about it. She says, well, you may not be going to Montgomery, but you're going to that church. <laughs> that goes. So I go, um, so I go to the church. Uh, Baldwin Hills, that big still today, it's like equivalent to, it's like a black belt air, black belt of hills. You know, very rich. If you're anybody, an African-American, you're loyal to you're professional, you're successful, you live in Baldwin Hill. Okay? I didn't know that, but I learned that. Okay? So Dr. King is, a, is the guest preacher, and he's introduced by the resident preacher, and he gets up, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the text of my sermon today is the role and responsibility of the Negro professional to aid our less fortunate brothers and sisters struggling in the South. So I thought to myself, this is my smart dude. Because he had come to give the right message at the right place. Now, I had never heard Dr. King speak. I, you know, I was in law school from 1956 to 1959. I hardly had a chance to go to the bathroom. You know, you know you'd be in law school. I mean, I took my law school serious. I was studying, and I had been in the, I was a veteran, so I came into the law school a little later than most people, so I was you know, I wasn't interested in no Martin Luther King Jr. or anything else. I wasn't interested. So I didn't know much about him. But I had never seen anybody with a human voice. 
speak that way. I had never seen, it was mesmerizing. It was, it was like unbelievable. It was just, I couldn't believe it. And then during the course of his sermon, he pauses and he says, and for example, <laughs> there's a young man sitting in this church today. <laughs> My friends in New York, for whom I have great respect, <laughs> my friends in New York tell me that this young man, a lawyer, <laughs> his, his brains have been blessed by Jesus. <laughs> my friends in New York tell me that when this young man goes and does legal research on any problem, he goes all the way back to the time of English common, beginning of English common law, the time of 1066, we have a conqueror the Magna Carta. <laughs> and then when he writes it down, and I'm thinking to myself, now this is the preacher, what do you know anything about English common law? And then he says, my friends in New York, whom I have great respect, tell me that when this young man writes it down, what he finds, the words are so compelling, they just jump off the page. <laughs> So I'm thinking to myself, I've only been in Los Angeles for a short period of time. I haven't, I mean, it, it bears no resemblance to a reality description of me. So I'm thinking when this summer is over, I'm still in the networking mood. So I'm going to meet this young man out of this church so he can do something to help me. And then he continues on. He says, well, I had a chance to meet with this young man in his home the other night. And I said, oh, Lord. I felt that small. And then there's a poem which I urge you to refresh your recollection. The poem is like Mother to Son, written by Langston Hughes. And the poem, the actual poem, is about the woman, the domestic woman, she's working the coop, washing some stairs. You know, you know, life ain't been no crystal stair, she says. But I'm doing this for you, son, don't you give up. So Dr. King, however, took poetic license and he took my mother and made her the actor in the poem. At this point, I began to cry in my place in the pew. Church service is over. I walk over to him, and as I'm walking, he's very popular, so he's standing on the entrance to the pulpit signing autographs. And as I walk over to him, he had the smile like a Cheshire cat that swallowed the mouse. He says, you know, I never mentioned your name, Mr. Jones. I never mentioned your name. <laughs> He says, we back this picture. I never mentioned your name. I just walked up to him and put my arm, my hand in his arm, in his hand, and I said, uh, Dr. King, when do you want me to leave my commandment? <laughs> that was what I call the making of a disciple. Now, 213 <laughs> is indeed the 50th anniversary year of Dr. King's celebrated I have a dream speech and his letter from a Birmingham jail. The speech occurred on August 28, 1968. The letter was written from jail in April over the course of three days. The legacy of Dr. King rests on the tripod of nonviolence, racial equality, and a struggle against poverty. The commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the legacy of Dr. King's dream speech, 150 years after Emancipation Proclamation, is fitting only if we understand and remember what was actually taking place in the country in the winter and spring and summer of 1963 on the issue of racial justice and equality 50 years ago. The leadership of Dr. King to transform our nation at that time was fundamentally influenced by several seminal, seminal events, including, for example, the initiation of the campaign to desegregate downtown department stores and public accommodation facilities in Birmingham, Alabama, which was really led by Fred Shuttlesworth. And then Dr. King's own arrest and incarceration, incarceration in jail of April 1963, from which he wrote the letter to the Birmingham jail. And then President John F. Kennedy's speech to the nation on June 11, 1963, in connection with the federalization of the Alabama National Guard to protect the admission of all three Lucy, the first black student to the University of Alabama. It was President Kennedy's first televised address to the nation in which he really posed the question, he says, we are confronted by a moral issue. It's as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the matter is whether all Americans ought to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. The first time the president ever spoken publicly to the nation on this issue. And then almost 24 hours later, on June 12, 1963, Medgar Evers, leader of the NAACP in Mississippi, is assassinated in his driveway in Mississippi. June 19th, 
week or more later, the 880th day of Chinese presidency, John Kennedy submitted his civil rights bill to Congress. Then in June, 19 June, Dr. King spoke to almost 100,000 people in Detroit. And then leaders of the civil rights movement decided that in order to bring pressure on Congress and to highlight the importance of the civil rights bill, they were going to have a so-called March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which took place. Now, prior to Martin Luther King, Jr., America was like a drug addict and dysfunctional alcoholic. We had become addicted to racial segregation and tried unsuccessfully to break our habit, our addiction. Then along comes, as I described him earlier, this fourth generation Baptist preacher from Georgia, who led America's conscience on a non-violent, civil dis disobedience road to recovery, to redeem, <laughs> to reclaim its soul, forcing our nation's conscience to confront the contradiction between the way it treated 12% of its population Negroes and the principles and precepts enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. I teach a course first in the, at Stanford University in the Graduate School of Continuing Education, which is taught over a period of 10 weeks in the form of a seminar, two and a half hours per week. And then I, I reconfigured that course as a visiting professor at the University of San Francisco. The course is from slavery to Obama. This reconfigured course is 15 weeks in the College of Arts and Sciences. During the course of that course, I say this to the students, if they remember nothing else in all this journey that I have said to them, this is the one thing I really want them to remember, because many of them are sitting in class with their laptops and iPads and so forth, taking notes. I said, write this down on a sheet of paper, put it in the iPad, but I remember what I'm now going to tell you, because this is the essence of who Martin Luther King Jr. in the pantheon of American history. And so I say to them, as I say to you, in 12 years and four months from 1956 until April 4th, 1968, the date of his assassination, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr may have done more to achieve racial, political, and social justice and equality in the United States of America than in all of the previous 400 years of the history of this nation. Now, I say to you, as I say to them, if you were fortunate enough When someone says to me, back up a little more, someone says to me, you know, Professor Jones, oh, who, who do you think today is most like Martin Luther King Jr.? And I listen to them carefully, though, and I think for a moment. You know, I was raised by uh, Catholic nuns, and, and, and I had a lot of Latin, so much so I could be excused in Latin in high school. There's a Latin phrase that you lost, but you must know about it, called the sui generis. Unique, one of a kind. So I, 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 I answer that question by posing a rhetorical question to them. Who today is most like Michelangelo? Who today is most like Galileo? Who today is most like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart? Copernicus, Shakespeare, no one. If you were fortunate enough to be alive from 1956 until April 4th, 1968, and you walked outside at midnight and looked up at the midnight sky and saw a shooting star of such incandescent brightness shooting across that midnight sky. A shooting star of brightness that had never 
before I've been seen in the heaven, so you have a seen in your lifetime. That shooting star, my friends, was Martin Luther King Jr. We will never, ever, 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 ever see that shooting star again. New phrases have developed in our discourse and commentary about social, political, and economic problems today. We are told that this or that problem has reached a tipping or inflection point. Presumably, this means that whatever it has cumulatively occurred on issues, such as the national debt, income disparity, and polarization between our two parties in Congress, deaths by gun violence, or Iran's nuclear programs, etc., all these desperate issues presumably have reached an inflection or tipping point requiring immediate and future qualitatively different actions than ever before. The 50th anniversary of the legacy of my beloved friend, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is not only at a tipping or inflection point after Newtown, Connecticut, but has positioned us as an, at an unavoidable crossroads. As a nation going forward, to quote Dr. King, it's no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence in this world, it's nonviolence and non-existence. Just as police dogs and high pressure fire hoses slamming young African American boys and girls against walls 50 years ago raised questions as to what kind of nation we are, Newtown, Connecticut today raises the same question. What kind of country are we when one of the parents can say to a reporter they are killing our babies? It has been reported that my beloved friend Harry Belafonte at a recent NAACP annual image award event raised the same question. He asked, where is, where, where, why is there so much black on black gun violence in our communities? And why aren't more leaders within those communities, especially faith-based leaders, taking a more aggressive stand to stop the violence? The legacy of Dr. King's unwavering commitment to nonviolent pursuit of justice, racial equality, and world peace endures as our country's moral compass. Indeed, this legacy may be the most important challenge he has bequeathed to us. Presidents Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Robert Kennedy were, like Dr. King, all assassinated by gun violence. While handguns account for only one-third of all firearms owned in the United States, they account for more than two-thirds of all firearm-related deaths each year. A gun in the home is four times more likely to be involved in an unintentional shooting, seven times more likely to be used to commit a criminal assault or homicide, and 11 times more likely to be used to attempt or commit suicide than used in self-defense. What we see and what Martin King would see if he returned to us 50 years later is a world that gives our youth violence. And the world of violence has many faces. We have violence in our homes. We have violence in our schools. We have violence against loved ones. We have violence against strangers. Youth violence particularly is a harmful behavior that can start early and continue into young adulthood. Bullying in school is a form of violence. The young person could be a victim, an offender, or a witness to the violence. What is our country's predominant response Solution to this social disease of violence? Incarceration. The United States has less than 5% of the world's population, but has almost a quarter of the world's prisoners. More than 2.3 million people are behind bars. Four out of five black or African American youths in some of the city communities can expect to be incarcerated in their lifetime. As recognized by the U.S. Conference of Mayors, quote, we cannot arrest our way out of this problem of youth violence today. 
Prevention is the key to long-term success. And much of the problem of the failure to address three decades of escalating violence is the failure of the multi-billion dollar so-called war on drugs. Dr. King would often remind us that more powerful than the march of mighty armies is an idea whose time has come. Additionally, he would often utter the phrase, the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. His most compelling use of that phrase was on March 25, 1965. After completing the third march in Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. King addressed the crowd assembled around him on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol. I was one of those persons in the crowd when Dr. King said, quote, I know you're asking today, how long will it take? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, and it bends towards justice, slain by the rifle bullet of a racist assassin in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King Jr. is unequivocally America's apostle of nonviolence. The greatest tribute we today can give in commemoration of this great apostle of nonviolence is to remind our nation that yes, the moral arc of the universe does bend to justice. But justice in honor of our brother Martin requires that we do whatever it takes 24-7 to initiate programs to reduce and eradicate the spread of the disease of gun violence in our country. No one wants to tell it like it is, but I am telling it like it is to you in case you have some reluctance to look at the facts and characterize them. In many of our urban communities, particularly African-American communities, they have become nothing less than black killing fields. Black killing fields, young black men killing other young black men with guns. St. Augustine of Hippo tells us that hope has two beautiful motives, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to commit oneself that they do not remain the way they are. So as we can pause and commemorate the 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, let me remind you that we adults are trustees of our most precious, unique assets, our children. As trustees, we have a fiduciary obligation to protect and safeguard our children. We must have the courage to commit ourselves that we will not permit things to remain the way they are. As again, to quote the anguish cry of one of the parents of the children in Newtown, Connecticut, they are killing our babies. We have an obligation not only to protect our babies, but also to intervene and prevent our children from killing one another in Oakland, Chicago, Richmond, Compton, San Francisco, Milwaukee, Detroit, etc., etc. God bless you.